Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. We will look today at verses 21 through 31, the end of this chapter, Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4, and beginning at verse 21. Brothers, sisters, let us hear the word of the Lord. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Amen. This ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your mercy towards us, and thank you for the love of God in Christ, and thank you for the freedom in Christ of which this passage speaks. And I pray that you would use the reading and preaching of the word today to make your church strong, that we, like Israel of old, might uh, follow your word and enjoy your blessing. They at times did not and experienced the consequences of covenant breaking. May we, as your assembly, follow your word and know your blessings. And would you grant then that we would be strengthened by your spirit to live before you and uh, out, do outreach into our community and call others to follow Christ and know your blessing upon your church. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever faced a situation where you got an offer and it sounded just too good to be true? Now, what's the saying that goes along with that? If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? In other words, it's not true. I read one story about a lady who had been wanting to change jobs for about six months when suddenly a friend that she used to work with called her and gave her an offer with the new company, and it came along with a $12,000 raise, not bad, four weeks of vacation, the health care was paid for 100%, by the company. They even bought lunch for everybody every other Friday. And she thought, this is going to be great. This is what I've been looking for. But she'd only been on the job about two weeks when it was a nightmare. It was a, it was a mismanaged company, and she was being overwhelmed with duties that went far beyond her abilities. She was hired for accounts receivable supervisor, and that meant she was to do collections handle all the receivables from hundreds of accounts with dozens of different payment terms, help the salespeople sale, create systems to help the company grow as a whole, and to do this with only two employees. She was really expected to run almost several departments with her and just two others. She would get called to meetings, and it would just be her and the person who called the meeting. Nobody else would bother to show up. She had been there a few weeks when she got a harsh call from the VP of finance. So she's been there only two weeks. He wants to know, hey, why aren't the numbers better? What are you doing? What are you accomplishing? She found out that the two previous people to work her position had just gotten up and left. They, they didn't bother putting a notice in. They just got up and left. And she actually learned the company hardly ever fires anybody because most people just quit. They can't handle working there anymore. And she admits, I, I took this job offer too quickly. It just sounded so ideal. It sounded too good to be true, and 
it was. You could go on. Probably you've heard stories about investment opportunities. They call and they offer uh, great returns on an investment. I read about the Freedom Bay Holiday Resort on St. Lucia. And they offered one potential investor not only great returns, but you can come stay in our resort a few times a year with your family for free. And he said, I didn't even know how they got my phone number, but it just sounded like such a good deal. I had to take it. And he invested 30,000 pounds, lives in the UK. And it wasn't long before the company was placed into liquidation. Now, amazingly, he actually got his money back, but that rarely happens. So what's going on in these stories? Well, we read these and we think, well, these people aren't being, they're not being careful. They're being naive. They're, they're, they're being scammed. Well, how is it that scams can work? On people, what, 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 how does a bogus offer succeed? Because what do they do? They hide all the negative stuff. They, they come right at you with all the good stuff, the stuff they know you want. And they try to entice you and appeal to you. And they really just hope you won't dig too deep and ask sensible questions and reveal the underlying danger. If you're going to expose the offer for what it really is, you've got to get behind the good front. And you've got to realize what's really going on. Well, in our passage today, Paul is going to do that. He's going to expose the Judaizers' false gospel for what it really is. He's going to show it might sound good what they're offering you, but here's really what's going on. You may have picked up, as we've mentioned several times throughout the book, these false teachers. They were insisting upon obedience to the Mosaic law in order to be accepted on the final day. Faith alone in Christ alone wasn't enough to save someone eternally. They had to also submit to the Mosaic law. Notice how Paul opens verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law. That gives us a clue for what the Galatians were saying. Now, the phrase in and of itself simply means under the law's authority, but it comes along with a bigger package than just submitting to the law's authority. Again, the the false teachers have come in and they've said, all right, you believe in Christ, but on the final day, how is God going to mark out his people? Who is God going to recognize as members of his people? Those who have the badge of faith or those who have the badge of faith and the Mosaic law for male circumcision and for all obedience to the laws of the Old Testament. They were saying you had to have all those badges in order to be recognized as a part of God's people on the final day. And Paul says, now that's a problem. If you submit to the law for that reason, it's not just like the Christian saying, well, we ought to obey God, certainly. But if you're saying I'm submitting to the law for that reason, that means you're thinking I must do something in order to be accepted by God On the final day, faith in Christ is not enough. It's not just the faith people who are accepted. It's the faith and the works people. And that is why Paul says, if you submit to the law for that reason, thinking that you've got to do something in order to be accepted, it's only going to be a dead end path. Because, and we'll come to this next week in chapter 5, when you take the law and you commit to the start of that path, you commit to the whole path. And you've got to do everything written in that law in order to be justified. And no one can do it. So if you come under the law for that reason, it's only going to be condemnation. Paul, Paul, in this passage, is going to try to get the Galatians to see that. That while the Galatians, or excuse me, the false teachers have come along and say, look, accept the yoke of the law, Paul is saying, listen, that offer is too good to be true. It sounds like they're saying, just do this and you'll be fine. But let's look at the real nature of the case. If you accept that offer, it will bring along with it slavery and misery and condemnation. And what Paul wants to do is is show them that in our passage today. And here's how he's going to do it. He's going to take the scriptures like he has done in the previous chapter. He's going to tell the story of the Bible one more time, the Old Testament story, and try to show them that, listen, the scriptures themselves expose this bogus story. Before we jump in, look at the end of verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? 
You want to submit to the law? But have you read the law? Have you read the scriptures in which you find the law? Do you understand their message, Paul asks his audience? And so he's going to make it crystal clear. He's going to stack up on one side, life under the law with its slavery and misery. And he's going to line up on the other side, life in Christ with its freedom Enjoy. We'll look at those. Let's work through the passage. Let's look at those two today because when we know what we have in the gospel, when we get the benefits, then we're not going to be enticed by the bogus offers and by works based religion. And let me give that to you in three ways. First, God gives us promises to trust instead of works to accomplish. On the grace side of things, He gives us promises to trust instead of works to accomplish. What we read in the first few verses really summarizes the whole passage. It sets the theme for everything that is to come. But let's look at what he says here in these verses. Again, verse 21, he says, I want you to hear what the scriptures say. And what he does then in the next verse, he doesn't actually quote a Bible verse, but he tells a Bible story in order to bring out these Principles. Look at verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. He is referring, of course, to the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar and the births of Ishmael and Isaac back in the book of Genesis. When we first meet Abraham and Sarah there, they have no children and they're past childbearing age. But God in his grace comes to them and he makes them a promise. You will have a son. In fact, your son will grow eventually into a great nation. But he starts with that promise. Abraham, Sarah, you're going to have a son. And Abraham and Sarah embrace that promise. They believe what God offers them. But God doesn't bring it about immediately. There's some time that goes by while they're waiting for the promise to come true. And they start to waver in their faith. And so Sarah concocts a scheme whereby Abraham will have a child naturally through her servant Hagar. And that son is born and they name him Ishmael. Now that is not what God was promising. He was not promising a son through Hagar. He was promising a son that would be born in a supernatural way, a miraculous way. And God eventually fulfills that promise through Abraham and Sarah, and you have the birth of Isaac. Now, look at verse 23, where Paul says, here's the point of those stories. Verse 23, his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. Notice the contrast. I really like the NLT here. Hear it. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. You get that? The birth of Ishmael through Abraham and Hagar, that was the result of humans trying to bring about what God had promised through human resources, the desires and strength of the flesh. And the result of that human attempt was a disaster. Go read the story in the book of Genesis. No sooner has this happened, Sarah and Hagar, they they start to despise one another. Hagar tries to run away. She almost dies in the desert before God comes and rescues her. There's conflict between the sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Again, Sarah finally tells uh, Abraham, get rid of her. And Abraham does it. He sends Hagar and Ishmael away. And again, they almost die in the desert before God comes and rescues them and makes them promises of their own. What's the point? When you and I try to take divine matters into our own hands, it is always going to be a disaster. If there are things that God has promised to do where God has said, I will do this myself, and we say, well, I'm going to contribute. I'm going to to bring that about. It will always be and badly. It will always cause problems. And that is in stark contrast to how Isaac was born. Again, the NLT. The son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment 
of the promise. They eventually learned to trust God and to wait on the Lord, and God brought about his promise. And here's what Paul's telling the Galatians. You do the same thing. You've entered this relationship by faith, and you're going to wait for the final day, the final coming of God to save and rescue his people and identify them as his own. And what is Paul saying? Are you going to get to that final day through something you do or through trusting the gospel? God has promised you eternal life from the moment you believe and trust Christ. So what will bring you through to the final day? It will be faith alone. Yes, obedience through the Spirit, but faith alone, the means by which we persevere. And I say this to say that not only for our own souls, where is your trust, friend, but also as we read the Bible, we read the Old Testament, it's full of laws, and it's easy to think, well, maybe those people were saved by their obedience to the law in the Old Testament. What is Paul doing again here? He's going all the way back to the beginning. He's saying, look at the whole message of the Old Testament. Look at these foundational principles. God always saves people by making them a promise and people embracing that promise in faith. What, there's something about us, I think, as humans that wants to do something, put our hands on something, control something in order to give us security, especially in spiritual matters. And God says, you trust my promise. It's in the word it is sealed through Christ. It is offered to you every Lord's day. You embrace that, the Lord says, and I will bring you through to the final day. Promises to trust, not works to accomplish. Let's come to the second section of the passage. We're going to come to verse 24. We're going to see that God gives us joy and freedom instead of misery and slavery. Joy and freedom as opposed to misery and in slavery. Now, Paul has told this story in the first verses. Sarah, Hagar, Isaac, Ishmael. But when he comes to verse 24, he's going to go and he's going to take those stories and he's going to say, now I want you to see how these principles go all throughout the Bible. How these principles interact with the Bible's story, even the Bible's geography. And maybe you noticed when we read it, it seemed a little strange, a little different from the way Paul usually talks. Let's see if we can make sense of what he's doing. Notice what verse 24, how it begins. He says, these things, talking about the story he just told, these things are being taken figuratively. That's the NIV. If you have the ESV, it says, now this may be interpreted allegorically. The NLT says it's an illustration And the New King James says these things are symbolic. So maybe you're reading that and you're wondering, okay, what is going on in this story? Basically what Paul is doing, he's going to show, I want you to see how these two themes, law and gospel, humans attempting to bring about God's promise versus humans trusting what God has said by faith. He goes, I want you to see that these reverberate throughout the whole history of the Bible. He isn't denying that the stories happened. He doesn't think they're myths or that he can just uh, deny their historicity. But he sees that in God's working in history, he builds certain themes into his story. And these two themes echo through the whole Old Testament. I just want to bring out two ways in which we see them. First, he says those two women, Sarah and Hagar, they represent two covenants. Now, what two covenants do they represent? Well, Paul tells us one of them in verse 24. He says, these women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. Paul is, and then he says, this is Hagar. So what is he saying? Hagar In Ishmael, which represents the human attempt to fulfill God's promise, that corresponds to Mount Sinai. And what covenant was made at Mount Sinai? The Mosaic covenant, in which God again gave Israel his law, showing them that they could never do enough to earn a right standing with God. And should they try to do so, the result would only be spiritual slavery. So notice one woman, one son, one mountain, one covenant. 
what stands on the other side of the comparison. Paul doesn't come right out and tell us, but since we have Sarah, who corresponds to God's fulfillment of his promise, we can deduce that the other covenant is either the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham, or the new covenant that Christ instituted at the Last Supper. Either way, what do those covenants emphasize? Faith in God's promises. I know Paul's getting a little thick here, but follow out his comparison. On the one side, you've got a covenant that emphasizes human obedience, and on the other side, you've got a covenant that emphasizes what? Trusting God's promises. Paul already made that comparison back in chapter 3. He goes on. Here's the second point. Look at verse 25. These women correspond to two cities. Look at verse 25. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. So Mosaic Covenant and now the present city of Jerusalem. Why identify Jerusalem? That's the center of modern day Judaism. And for the most part, Jews in Paul's day reject Christ. They reject his offer of salvation. They reject his offer of forgiveness. Paul says that's just continuing that whole theme that started with Hagar. Humans trying to fulfill God's promises. Humans trying to bring about God's promises by their works. It leads to a covenant that emphasizes law and corresponds to a city full of people trying to do enough to merit God's blessing. And what is the result? Slavery. And then he comes to the other side and he says, those who believe God's promises were citizens of a different city. Verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother. And you're wondering, what is this Jerusalem above? It's the heavenly Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem that God's people were expecting to appear in the last days when God would appear to fulfill his promises. He would remake his people. He would remake his land. He would remake his city. And you know what Paul is saying? Those who identify with Christ are already enjoying that in times city. We're free in God's new creation. It's already begun. You can't see it in the way you'd expect it with a city, but it started here in the church. This is God's citizenship. This is God's city. This is God's land. And those who enter it by faith enjoy freedom. And that's the contrast that Paul wants to make. How are you going to get into those end times blessings? How are you going to be a part of God's people in the last days? Through the works of the law? Or through faith alone. Faith alone enters the eternal end time inheritance right now by trusting in Christ. And look at verse 27, which concludes this section and drives the whole point home. For it is written, be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. I won't go into the details, but this comes from Isaiah 54.1. And the whole end of Isaiah is Isaiah looking ahead and seeing that Israel would go into exile and saying, one day God will bring you home. He will free you. He'll remake your land, as we have just said. And what does Paul say? He, He will give you children, just like he did with Sarah, and you'll rejoice. And what is Paul saying? It's begun now. It's begun in Christ. It's begun through his resurrection. It's begun through the Spirit. And that was was the real sticking point, I think, for the Jews in Paul's day. This was a scandal that God would bring about what he had promised and all these Old Testament prophets this way, through a crucified and resurrected Christ, through a church composed not only of Jews but of Gentiles, that he would come and institute a new covenant. They just couldn't, they couldn't grab, grapple that that was how God would do this. But Paul the same, because Christ rose from the dead and poured out his spirit. We can look back and see from the Old Testament, this is what God planned all along. And I know that's a little thick. And if we're wondering, okay, well, what does it mean for me? How do you become a part of God's people? How do you enjoy the salvation he's promised? 
How do you participate in the blessings of the last days? By faith alone in Christ alone. Don't be deceived by anything that says you've got to do this in addition to faith. It is faith alone that lays a hold of those blessings. And by the way, Isaiah 54 comes right after what? Isaiah 53, the great passage of Christ, the servant who is rejected for us and raised to life by God. Through Christ, we enter these final blessings. You labor under the load of a guilty conscience, of thinking you still got to do something to complete God's gracious work to you. Paul is telling you that only ends in slavery. Christ has done it all. Enjoy him by faith. Let me mention this last point, and I will close. Uh, And you can go home and reread the passage and try to digest uh, some of what Paul is saying here, because I know he's thicker than he normally is. But look at this main point, or this third point, because this is pretty clear. God gives us the inheritance of his children instead of bondage to false teachers. Look at verse 28 where he concludes, now you brothers and sisters like Isaac, you are the children of promise. With all this talk of the law and obedience and with all these Judaizers trying to say, hey, we're Abraham's children. We have the marks of his children. Paul takes their story and he totally redoes it and says, those in Christ have the marks of God's people. You are the children of Abraham. You are the ones who inherit the end times blessing through faith. The resurrection of Christ proves that and enjoy that blessing. But what admonition then does he give them in verse 30? But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. He's quoting Sarah's words there. He's not commenting on whether those Uh, That was a right attitude by her or not. But he's saying, just like Ishmael was finally sent away, you Galatians need to send these false teachers away. And you need to send everything that smells or smacks of works religion, you need to send it away. Because all it does is leads to bondage and destroys the assurance and and, and destroys the joy of God's people. I'll close with this. Friend, are you an unbeliever? Have you never trusted Christ alone for salvation? Are there things you're doing that you think that this is my security with God or this makes me better than others or this guarantees that I'll go to heaven when I die or participate in this new creation? You can never do enough. And Christ has already done it all for you. And friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord, don't be enticed by works-based religion Works-based approaches to Christianity. Everything you need, you have in the gospel through Christ and through the Spirit. And as you rejoice in that, you'll be protected from false teaching and you'll enjoy the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And I pray you would give us greater understanding of your word, even when we come to passages where Paul's reasoning or the inspired author's reasoning is maybe a little different from what we're used to. Lord, give us greater understanding of the scriptures, but thank you that their main message is clear, which is we can be saved by the grace alone of Christ. And I pray that you would save, as we've already prayed, unbelievers in our family or unbelievers in our midst, if there are any here today that are not Christians, you'd save them by your grace. You'd taste and see that the Lord is good and trust Christ alone and enjoy his mercy. And I pray for us as believers that we would enjoy this grace, that we would live it out by the Spirit, but we would enjoy the grace and the freedom that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.